Welcome. Uh, my name is Susan Polly. I'm the director here at the Upper DDA. Uh, I'm very grateful you all made time. You're going to help us look really smart. The projects that we're about to talk about, I'm really grateful uh, that you're going to help weigh in. I'm going to begin a little bit. Uh, the first of my talking is about the business of things. Many of you found the pizza. There's also water out there where the pizza comes to eat the water. And with that comes the need for bathrooms, which you go in the hallway and to the left. There are two bathrooms on the other side. Uh, a little bit about tonight. Uh, today's program is to talk about four streets in downtown. You're on First and Ashley and William by Glenn William. Uh, many of you know the DDA, but for those that don't, the DDA has been around for a couple decades. And among the ways we make our mission is um, Ann Arbor uh, planner. And, um, <laughs> about, among the ways we meet our mission is making improvements to downtown infrastructure in the way of way. And you may know us from some of our previous projects. A project we took out a decade ago was restoring two-way traffic in the station area. Some of you may not realize, but there was a maze of one block one ways up there. We installed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of downtown street trees. So much of the greenery you see in downtown is DDA, bike loops, that's us. Our most recent project was in South U this summer where we widened the sidewalks without really touching much of the street. The parking still goes on. But it gave us the opportunity for rain gardens, a lot more seating. It gave us the opportunity for cafes and so forth that we had to do. Uh, in about two weeks, we're going to start work with the city on our next project, which is in the area next to the farmer's market. Uh, together, we'll be uh, going in and moving the underground utilities. We'll be making improvements to the crossings. We have a high school in downtown, and uh, having improved crossings is safer for them, safer for all of us who are in that area. And then we'll be restoring that historic work. Uh, that's a project I know all of us want to see done. Uh, but that will soon be underway. Today we're talking about our next series of people friendly streets. What that means is streets are designed for people. And I know that seems like an easy concept, but I was sharing, I've been on vacation last week in a place where it was not designed for people. The roadway was incredible. Incredibly fast moving, unbelievably hard to cross the street to get across, uh, very much unsafe. And I was with two people that had surgeries, one of them replaced his hip and the other with replaced knees. And they walked about as slowly as people could, cautiously. And here's this traffic speeding with almost no place to make a safe cross. That is not a people friendly street. What we're talking about are streets that are functioning in many ways pretty well, but were once upon a time uh, different. They actually emphasized the people that lived there, that had businesses there. They emphasized a pace that wasn't a car-centered pace. It was human-centered. And so we're going to talk about that with the streets that are on, on our plate today. As I said, here on First and Ashley and William. Today is going to be an overview. Uh, we're going to have a 45-minute you know, project overview. Time for questions and answers, you know, Q&A afterwards, and then a general discussion. And, uh, at that point, you're going to be welcome to, to meet with members of the design team. I'm going to go through introductions right now because there are a few of them here. Uh, tomorrow, and I made a note for myself so that I would know what it is, tomorrow there will be an open design studio all afternoon, 1 to 5, here at the DDA. And what you're, you're welcome to do is come and watch the design team as they are looking at these maps and thinking through strategies of ways to make these streets even more people friendly. And they are welcoming you to come and join them with a pen and show them where you're saying, this needs to be changed, or I've never liked the sight lines as I cross the street in this location. We're going to do the same thing the very next day at the library. We'll be downstairs in the basement in the multi-purpose room. Uh, that'll be on Wednesday from 9 to 11. Open. Everybody's welcome. Come. Offer your ideas. Directly talk to members of the design team. And then on Thursday night from 6 to 8, the design team is going to give a presentation to you. And they're going to say, this is what we've heard, and here are some of our ideas how we think we can make some changes that would be some good. And they're going to welcome you to give feedback on those ideas. So it's going to be very interactive. This is where you guys are the experts. And you're going to help them to understand how these streets could function or are functioning well already. Um, with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn ourselves over to Oliver Kiley, who works with the city of JR. Are you going to begin our program? Yep. Great. Thank you, Susan. And so I'll be. Uh, Fairly brief here. Um, I just want to reiterate again and, and welcome everybody for coming out. This is a great turnout tonight, and it's a beautiful evening. So I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. 
A um, couple things. Um, Susan mentioned the design team. So we have uh, kind of these slightly fancier name tags on. Um, after the meeting, feel free to grab any of us and share your thoughts and ideas. Some of us will be up here at the big maps that are printed out to engage with you and also at the boards in the entry room where you came in. So love to get your feedback and help answer your questions. Um, as far as turning this on goes, um, one sec. There we go. Um, so as Susan mentioned, um, the People Friendly Streets project is kind of an umbrella for all of the street projects that the DDA is doing. I'll speak very briefly to that and then um, Ian Lockwood, one of the partners working on this project with us, will speak um, a little bit more uh, broadly about our use of language and how we think about the design of streets in an urban environment. I think that's going to be a really um, inspiring and thought-provoking discussion. And then we'll get into some of the specifics on the First and Ashley and William Street bikeway project, um, and then the Huron Street project as well. So the Huron project's a little further along in the design phase, and we, we'll be able to share some of that with you. So the formal part of this will be about 45 minutes. We'll take 15 minutes or so um, to kind of have some discussion and answer some of your general questions. And then we can break up and speak more one-on-one -on -one at, um, at the maps and at the stations. So just one of the things to think about, um, Susan spoke to some of the DDA's mission in terms of trying to strengthen the downtown. But the thing that's really important to think about is that you know streets in the public realm, that is the public space of the downtown that we all inhabit. And so whether we're coming into downtown by car, by bike, by bus, or walking, you know, at the point that we're walking in the front door of a restaurant or a business or a shop, we're all kind of pedestrians. We're all people trying to access spaces in the downtown to use the streets, to be outside in that environment. So it's really important that we think about you know, how we shape streets and create the kind of environment that encourages business, that encourages activity, that encourages all of that kind of exchange of civic ideas um, that are so important to us. And so with that in mind, um, the People Friendly Streets really sets out kind of a broad, um, broad uh, set of goals for what we want to achieve. And these aren't um, in any particular order with the exception of the first one that's really critical um, that we be thinking about how we make um, downtown a safe environment for everybody, whether you're biking, whether you're in a car, whether you're walking um, or riding the bus. And uh, the city, as some of you may know, has adopted a Vision Zero um, principle to work towards having zero um, pedestrian um, and, and otherwise uh, traffic-related deaths or severe injuries. So that's something that we really want to put forefront in all of our discussion today, is how we're working towards that vision. Um, in terms of the other goals, just designing green streets, helping to strengthen that business environment, celebrating our civic life, all of those kinds of things are really critical. Um, so with that very brief introduction out of the way, I'm going to turn things over to Ian to walk us through the next little section here. Good, thanks, Oliver. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Ian Lockwood with Tool Design Group. I'm a transportation engineer. And um, I took the precaution of writing out my entire talk um, so I don't forget anything. So I'm going to be talking about um, language and culture, shifting culture. And then I'm going to be talking about a few case studies and um, what it means to go from a one-way street to a two-way street. Um, then I'll, talk, I'll end up with a little bit of um, some ideas about uh, separated bike facilities, you know, uh, friendly bike infrastructure. So a little bit about language. Um, clothes, words are clothes that ideas wear. Um, if you have an idea and you give it a good word, uh, people will like the idea more, uh, more often than not. If you give it a, a, a bad word, uh, people will not like the idea. And I'll give you some examples um, in a second. So when I was a little kid, um, it was during the uh, women's movement back in the, the 60s and 70s. For those of you who remember, um, there were all, was all this coded language. And my older sister said, you got to stop using that language because the world's changing. And, and she used these examples like policeman, fireman, mailman, man power, man hours, and chairman. And um, she said, you know, those are gender biased. And I said, well, you know, I was just a kid, and I said, well, everyone knows what I mean. And she says, no, you can either be inclusive or not. And, and so I said, well, I want to be inclusive. So 
we started using words like this, police officer, firefighter, mail carrier, human resources, hours, and chair. And so a lang your language can create a bias and perpetuate a bias. And, and now we've made our language um, gender neutral. Women can participate in um, you know, fields that they didn't before. In fact, most of our team, the majority of our team is, are, are females. And that wouldn't have been this, the case 30-something you know, years ago when I started engineering. Improvement. So this is, once your street is improved, the curve will be right here. So, so these two people have different ideas of what improvement <laughs> means. Um, he thinks that um, you know, making the street wider for motorists is an improvement. And she doesn't agree what, at all, because uh, it's not an improvement for her. So by using the word improvement, it shows a bias towards those who benefit and a bias against those who get harmed. And there are objective terms uh, that can be replaced, that improvement can be replaced with, like widening. So you can have a good discussion about a widening, but when you call it an improvement, it, it kind of taints things to be pro-widening. Uh, and there's all sorts of other words. Um, there's the improvement. I'll just go through a couple of them. Um, efficient. Our profession always uses efficient. We mean fast. If you want to speed up the road, it's not really efficient. It's about speed. Uh, the capacity of the street, my profession um, defines the capacity of the street, uh, uh, how many cars can cross a line in an hour. That's considered the capacity of the street. Yet we all know that streets have the capacity to create identity, to nurture businesses, uh, to be places to grow up on, to be recreational facilities, social places. Streets have the capacity to do all sorts of things. But we kind of monopolize the idea uh, through language. Uh, delay is one that I really don't like. Um, we did a project in Trenton, New Jersey to remove a uh, highway out of the city because it was creating so many problems and cutting the city off from the, the waterfront. And we were replacing it with a beautiful boulevard and a connected network of streets. And somebody said, what's the delay going to be for me? Because you know, I drive through the, you know, along the highway through the city. And I said, well, there won't be any delay. And he goes, what, are you kidding me? It's going to take me way longer to go through than uh, it does today. And I go, Oh yeah, the, there'll be an increase in travel time, but there won't be any delay because delay implies a problem that needs solving. So it's, it's not a delay, it's actually a correction. And we're just changing the travel time to something that's appropriate for the context. And so he thought, oh, you're splitting hairs. But, <laughs> but, the, but the point was that as long as, if I used the, the word term delay as, as representing you know, the city or the Department of Transportation, it, Im it implies that I agree with him that he should be able to speed through the city at 60 miles an hour. And then um, alternative, alternative modes of transportation. You know, a lot of folks think cars are normal and that walking and biking are, are alternative. But we've been walking. How long have humans been walking? Like <laughs> a long time. Yeah, a, lo a long time. And so how did it become alternative? You know, um, anyway, there's a whole bunch of these. and. Um, they were all coined in the, um, you know, between probably 1910 and 1960 in the, kind of the golden age of the motor vehicle. And they had the, sort of that um, leaning towards them. So we're slowly replacing these with um, objective language so that we can have frank discussions about what's best for our cities. So here are some of the new terms. And I, I just listed these because these are all new terms that came along since I started engineering. You know, traffic calming, contact sensitive solutions, road diets. You know, complete streets. Um, and all of these terms express what we call traditional values, values that have been with cities for thousands of years. But we, we didn't need terms for these until the car came along and all the modernist sort of new terms came along. These terms were invented to kind of defend the city, defend the uh, vulnerable people in the city. So the idea is if we want to um, you know, kind of change the culture, we need to change the language so we can have objective conversations. This is South Bend, Indiana. Oh, the reason I think Tool Design Group is on this team is because we've, we've done a lot of one-way to two-way restorations um, around the country. And, and we call them restorations now on purpose because all of these streets were two-way. And they were made one-way in the 1970s uh, for the purpose of just getting traffic through quickly, which damaged businesses, which damaged the image, which you know, created safety issues and all sorts of things. So we call them two-way restorations because we don't, we don't want to say two, a two-way conversion because it sounds weird. Like it's, and it also implies that the streets were always one way, which they, which they weren't. These are restorations. So anyway, South Bend, Indiana, 
a beautiful two-way street network. After the Second World War, had a very intact fabric of buildings, very successful city. And this is what it looks like today. And what happened was that the traffic engineers back in the 50s and 60s made one-way streets, and they exported value out of the city, uh, devalued the inside of the city, and buildings were torn down to make room for surface parking lots um, you know, for the now car-dependent population. And of course, the downtown uh, struggled, and uh, the businesses on the one-way street suffered the most. So this is Main Street. It's a four-lane state-owned um, road going away from us, four lanes that way. And then the other way, uh, there used to be these two theaters, and one of them got knocked down to make room for the four-lane road coming the other way. So that's the, the leftover theater, and the, the other one was right here. And so now they have these, this big, giant four-lane, uh, sorry, eight-lane, four lanes each way, one-way pair. And so we had a lot of meetings with a lot of people, and we were trying to kind of capture the culture and the values of the people. What was important in the downtown, and how are we, how are we gonna recapture that? And so uh, we came up with a vision for the, for the downtown as a sort of a place where people come for businesses to buy things, to um, exchange ideas, all these sorts of things that we do in, in downtowns. So this is a map of the, the city, and this is their downtown right here. And these were the one-way streets. And I guess we did the project maybe, what, five years ago or so? And today, all of those one-way streets are now two-way streets. And I'll show you a couple of um, examples. But the interesting thing was that this, the downtown has become more livable, more walkable, the businesses are doing better. Access is increased. It's, it's actually doubled because we, you can go both ways. Wayfinding is way easier. Like you can, give, you, you can give directions and you don't have to say, go past your destination and then turn around. And you, know, you probably have to do that here too sometimes. So this is our plan. We actually drew you know, on, on drawings like this the whole, the whole place. And this is one of the streets. This is uh, St. Joseph. It's the northbound four lanes along the waterfront. So notice a couple of details. like. The small sidewalk with the post in the sidewalk. Now the after picture is that one. So it went from four lanes to two with left turn lanes. So now here's the separated bike facility and um, nice walking facility. And investment coming in, the brand new building. No, no new buildings had come in for years there. So um, it's completely changed the uh, tenor along the, the water. Um, it's much friendlier. You know, people didn't used to r bike ride, now they do routinely um, bike ride. This is Main Street, and uh, that's the before picture, and that's the after picture. Same thing, um, four lanes down to two lanes with left turn lanes, separated bike facility, walking, uh, you know, more restaurants moved in, um, just made the place way more vibrant. Because that was the original intent of, of these streets, was to encourage commerce and exchange. So the things we've been talking about so far are what we call traditional values, those values of, that have been with cities for thousands of years. Designing for short trips, rewarding proximity, connected networks, access, um, slower speeds. These are all things that make downtowns successful. And when you think of your favorite cities that you go to, go to on vacation, it's probably cities that have these values. Any, any examples? Anybody think of a great city you go on vacation? Paris, uh-huh. Pittsburgh, yeah, New Orleans, Sydney. Yeah, all traditional places. And uh, no one said Phoenix. <laughs> There's a reason for it. Um, so fundamentals. Why do we even have cities in the first place? Why do they even exist? Why were they invented? Well, the fundamental purpose of cities is to advance efficient and effective exchange. The transportation purpose of cities is actually to bring people together for um, exchange, to reduce trip lengths, actually. And my profession has been busy speeding up roads and making one-way streets and, and spreading cities out, which uh, is anti-exchange. And when you think fundamentally, it's actually anti-city. And when you think of the cities that did that the most, they tend to be the worst cities. And the land use purpose of cities is to concentrate the components of civic life into close proximity so you can maximize the exchange. And then of all the places in a city where exchange should be the highest, is it, it's in your downtown. And in your downtown, the, the place where exchange should be the highest is along 
your main street, of course, or your main streets or your, or your, your main street district. Now, in 1910 to 1930, this movement came along called modernism. And they thought they had a better, I better idea, a better way to build cities than had been uh, figured out through trial and error over a few thousand years. And one of the, um, the key leaders in that movement was this guy, Cabousier. And modernism brought all kinds of cool things to society. Modern art, modern dance, modern music. Some modern buildings. <laughs> Sorry if any architects are here. Um, but they really dropped the ball on transportation planning and, and city planning. And this is a famous quote by Cabousier, cars, cars, fast, fast. You know, deep, deep stuff. Um, <laughs> like, he really thought this through. But he was, he was enamored with the speed of cars, and he thought you know, promoting their speed was more important than uh, the fabric of the city. So he came up with ideas for streets that were were abnormal. You know, no one had ever seen anything like it before, this sort of idea of separation. And his, his, his big idea was um, connecting objects in the landscape. Getting from A to B was more important than the fabric of the city. So speeding cars past your businesses was more important than your business or your home uh, or your downtown. And that, that drawing and this idea was the foundation for you know, blasting highways through cities and, and, and one-way streets and these sorts of things. The tipping point for the modernist movement was 1939, the World's Fair in New York. Norman Del Geddes um, developed the Future Ram exhibit where people lined up and then sat in these chairs and went around this giant model. And, and the whole thing was made feasible by this, the idea of magic motorways where you could drive your car and never have to stop. Now, that's his idea of a great city. It sounds like hell on earth to me. <laughs> I can't stop. But that's, um, that's what they did. They had all these um, fancy um, ramps and so forth. The industrialists got in on it. Uh, they felt they could sell a lot more cars um, with this idea of long distance trip making. It will solve the problem of the city by leaving the city. So they knew that if we sprawled, then people would become car dependent and, and drive long distances. And this was where it was all going. Do you remember? Um, when you're a kid watching Disney, you know, with the Jetsons and all this sort of thing, this is where it was supposed to be heading, that we could get into these little tubes and, and, and fly around between objects in the landscape. So when I was in engineering school, my professor on a blackboard drew this grid of streets, and then he drew a target on it. And he said, traditionally, value is a function of proximity. The closer you're to the downtown, the more valuable the land. And as you moved out, the land would get less and less valuable. Then he drew this on the board and said, as, as future traffic engineers, your job is to speed up the, the roads because value is a function of travel time, not proximity. So he said, you got to speed up the roads, and, it, and then within a five minute contour, you, you capture more land the faster you make the roads compared to you know, traditionally slower streets. And this is the diagram. This is the idea that set. Um, set the stage for all the measures of effectiveness for modern transportation engineering, reducing travel time, reducing delay, all this sort of thing. And what happened was that this didn't come true. What they had this assumption that all else would stay equal. But when they sped up the roads, it, it disadvantaged the businesses. It exported value out from the city to the suburbs. It didn't um, spread it out. It exported it. And it created barriers in the community. Um, people can't cross the street safely or comfortably, that kind of thing. So it didn't work. And these are the values that go with the modernists. Um, rewarding long trips, high levels of service for motorists, uh, speeding things up, um, vilifying congestion. Uh, but it was individually appealing because they could say to an individual, um, wouldn't you rather get to work faster than slower? You go, yeah, I would. Uh, wouldn't you like to get to the grocery store faster or drop your kids off at school or whatever it was? It, was, um, it really was appealing. I I would call it even sim sim simplistic, because it didn't account for how complex cities were. So here's an old map of Ann Arbor. And you can see the traditional street network. So your, your entire DNA, especially your downtown, was founded on traditional values. Proximity, exchange, um, relationships are all built into your, your city. And then. In the 60s and 70s, somebody came along, this is 1967, somebody came along with this idea 
of speeding things through. And that became the, um, this was the plan for Ashley and, and Hearst. It didn't get completed, but it was started. And uh, just like other places, it, it, it harms the, the context that these are, are placed in. So the modernists, uh, if you look at Del Getty's original drawings for the interstate, this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to have highways going between cities, and then when you left the, the interstate, the idea was the, this, the, um, the interchange would break up into the network, which was city friendly, and that's more or less what they did in Europe. But here, the modernists were so powerful, this idea of going from A to B quickly um, um, defeated this idea, and that was the idea. You wanted to bring the traffic through the city um, faster, which of course was highly damaging uh, to the city. And so this is Detroit, just up the road. Uh, they had a beautiful, this is an x-ray of their streets, beautiful street network, uh, traditional street network. There's downtown. And they embraced modernism. After the Second World, they had so much money. You know, they built so much for the war effort. Not a single bomb fell on Detroit. They were, and they wanted to be the best city in the world. And they, they embraced modernism more than any other city and, and built 375 through and did the uh, Cabousier Towers in the park. And that fabric turned into that fabric. There's the highway. There's the towers in the park. And they completely ruined the relationships between the neighborhoods and neighborhoods and neighborhoods in downtown, devaluing the city so much that of the 1.8 million people that live there, 1.2 million of them uh, moved out mostly into Wayne County, into the, into the suburb, creating car-dependent people who then had to use the infrastructure to come back. And that's what it looked like. Um, it, just, it was such a beautiful city before, and, um, and they turned it into that and devalued a lot of the neighborhoods, as, as you all know. So this is our first plan to remove Interstate 375, and it's to restore Hastings Street and a lot of the relationships that used to exist. And so if you ask the governor or the secretary of the DOT, it's not if the highway is going to get taken out, it's when. And so there's been a number of plans to remove it since, since our first plan. Um, so it's, it's going to come out eventually. And, um, and those are. So it had a traditional city. These modern ideas came in, damaged the city, and its traditional values that are actually repairing the city. So you look at all the other things they're doing in Detroit. Um, you know the the rail down Woodward. You know what they're doing in the alleys, some of the streets that they're they're humanizing, that their park system, all based on traditional values. They are bringing life back to Detroit. So this is that part about the rational thing. Um, it's rational in my self-interest to want to get to places faster rather than slower. So isn't it rational that everybody get to places faster rather than slower? So wouldn't it be great if the entire city, you could just get everywhere fast <laughs> rather than slower? But the cities that did it tended to do the most damage to their cities, you know, with the sprawl and the barriers and so on. So sometimes when something's rational in your own self-interest, if it's scaled up to all of society, it's, it's highly damaging. We call it the tragedy of the commons. And there's some other ones too, like personally, it's rational and in my self-interest not to want to pay any taxes, as long as all you guys pay <laughs> taxes. You know. But if we all didn't pay taxes, it would be, it would be a bad thing. So there's some, some things where it just doesn't scale up, and this is, is one of those examples. So when we have these... Um, conversations about change in cities, whether it's adding a turn lane or restoring two-way operations on a one-way street or anything like that, there's usually two camps that come out. There's the conventional modern camp and there's the tradi traditional camp. And these two sets of values clash. Um, the traditionalists want two ways, the modernists want one way. And the, the fight is really about which paradigm prevails. And if you, if you talk to people from Ann Arbor, they tend to lean traditional. They like proximity. They like exchange. They like a downtown where they, they, there's image and character and that, that sense of community. These are all traditional values. You know, more options, social interaction, safe speed, shorter trips, integrated land use planning, making places. You know, these are all things that most people here agree with. Um, but it, it's always this proxy fight. So in a lot of cities, we recommend you know, have a conversation about your values and, and pick a value set, and you'll argue a lot less. 
So some of the conventional advantages of one-way streets, so if, if you buy into the modernist conventional paradigm, it's easy to design the signals for progression. You know, the light turns green just before you get to the next intersection. But you notice you only look at the lights. You don't really look at businesses or what's going on. Um, accommodates longer distance travel due to faster speeds. And that's just unhealthy for your city. You know, it might be an advantage for people who are driving through, but it's not good for your city. And then it transitions nicely into ramps for, for hi um, highways, which is probably not a healthy thing for your city either. And then there's a ton of advantages, traditional advantages for two-way streets. And that's why cities grew up for thousands of years with two-way streets. Uh, you, get, you go directly where you want to go. Um, because you go directly, you don't have to go through as many intersections with, with one-way streets. So you get shorter travel, travel distances. So you, any intersection, uh, there's probably 10% fewer cars going through because you get, it's a 10% shorter trip. So you, have, you actually have less traffic with direct routing. Slower speeds, you don't have people going the wrong way. We've heard all kinds of stories. Have you ever seen anyone go wrong way on these streets? Yeah, every, okay, everybody. Um, flexibility, like if you want to shut the street down for, let's say, a business wants to do, or a few businesses want to do some sort of art show or um, you know, something in the street, the other street can carry the, the traffic during the, the evening or the weekend. Uh, sign pollution, all that stuff saying don't enter or one way. Um, inevitably, retailing and businesses uh, improve with two-way streets. Way easier to give directions. The image, whenever I see a one-way street and those do not enter signs and so forth, I, I know that throughput is more important than place. And here, I think uh, everyone I've talked to, place is more important than, than throughput. Um, intuitive bus routing, you can get on and off on the same street. You don't have to go a block over. And that's the original intent. Your, your city was designed for two-way streets. And uh, it's not important here, but in some places there's a lot of crime and we find crime gets reduced with two-way streets because there's increased natural surveillance. And then property values tend to go up, up with um, two-way streets. And then one of the collateral benefits of two-way streets is increased safety. Inevitably, we, we slow the motors down and it's safer and more comfortable to walk and ride your bike um, as a result. So with, with slower speeds, um, collisions are less severe and there's less uh, likelihood to be injured or killed. And then lastly, just a little bit about um, bike infrastructure. So right now there's very little um, comfortable bike infrastructure in the city. There's some you know, wider shoulders some with a painted line, the sort of conventional bike lanes. And that appeals to a small percentage of potential cyclists. There's some, si some people who just won't ride a bike, um, but there's a large percentage who who are interested, but they're concerned about their safety or, or comfort on the street. And it's that perception, you know, getting people comfortable enough to ride is, is really important. So this is what we have been doing with sort of conventional bike lanes, but like I said, it only appeals to a low number of, of people. And this sort of thing appeals to a, a greater number of people. I mean, you go to countries that actually have uh, proper bike infrastructure, there's a lot more people cycling. And this is um, some graph of some American cities. And you can see they, that people ride more when the infrastructure is placed in. Now, if you go to Portland or Seattle or Washington, D.C., where we've installed a lot of bike infrastructure, or, or even in, in Denver or Madison, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, as soon as the bike infrastructure is in, people start riding. Um, so this is a Dutch guy chilling along on his bike with his book. Here's an American. <laughs> um, Highly nervous, dressed for battle, you know, um, out there on his bike. And he should be dressed for battle because the, the safety statistics are, are telling. Um, it's, you're far more likely to get into a, a serious crash in the United States uh, than you are um, where there's a nice bicycle infrastructure. So we've written some books on this. Um, they're over there if you want to look through them about how to build bicycle infrastructure. And uh, in it, we talk about the different types of cyclists. We break them up into four groups. Uh, these are like kids. These are the, the spandex crowd that will ride just about anywhere. Um, and then there's people in between. There's, it's called level of traffic stress. These folks are very sensitive. These folks are insensitive. And what we try and do when we do a bike plan for a city is um, figure out what group we're trying to design for and then um, make comfortable infrastructure for that group. So here's, um, here's a city, and there's 
this is a, uh, the comfortable route for probably uh, level of traffic stress, maybe three, so, uh, or two rather. So people who are concerned. But there's a lot of destinations that you can't get to. And by, by making some strategic tweaks and changes to the streets, we can increase the, the, the biking um, access incredibly and connect more people and businesses with, with people on bikes. So in a nutshell, when you have more than 6,000 cars a day on a street or more than 20 miles an hour, it's best to have separated bike facilities because then a lot more people will ride their bikes than, than on conventional streets. And then in the books that you can read over there, you'll see all kinds of graphs about how to design separated bike facilities, how to do intersections, how to do bus stops, There's how to, how to do signal timing. It's all in those books if you're interested um, in that kind of thing. So lastly, it's really easy to accommodate loading, trucks, buses, cars. We'll ensure that all the streets, you can get your goods delivered, you can um, drive on them, you can, um, you know, handling the motors is probably the easiest part of our job. There's more sensitive users where comfort's important, the pedestrians and the cyclists, we're getting a lot better at that and a lot of that's in that book and a lot of that's what we're gonna be drawing. And then the other side of complete streets is designing streets to actually nurture the businesses, help them succeed. Um, help the people who live there have a high quality of life. That uh, Help the people who have mobility impairments get around comfortably. Um, to support the institutions, your, your, your neighborhoods, your businesses, and your recreational areas. And then uh, this is an aerial of your, your city. And what we noticed was there's a ring of highways around it. And from anywhere out here to the, in the middle, it's a 15 minute bike ride. Like, it's not a giant city. And um, so when you're in this ring, you ought to kind of design your city for exchange and you know, these traditional values. And you know, know when you cross this line that there's important things here. Kids might be crossing the street and that kind of thing. And when you get into downtown, even more so, this is a territory where it should be uncompromisingly about exchange and business and ideas and social interaction, these sorts of things. So, so so don't, um, don't have sort of highway expectations or, or high-speed arterial expectations you know, in, your, in your areas where you want um, you know, social and economic exchange to happen. So that's, that's kind of the bottom line. That's what we're hearing from you, and so that's kind of what we're reflecting back. So that, I'll pass the baton back all over. Thank, thank you. Great. Thanks, Ian. And I'm sure there's some probably some questions about that. So um, we have a few more slides that we'll walk through and then we'll have some time for... <laughs> it's, a, it's a good looking street. Um, so a little bit on the first and Ashley and William Street project. Um, overall we talked about the People Friendly Streets projects. So there's a bunch of those going on right now. Um, some that have wrapped up. So Southview was just um, finished construction last year. Fifth and Detroit, as soon as the frost uh, restrictions are lifted, construction's going to start on that. And then the Huron project is in kind of a design and engineering phase. And then first and Ashley in the William Street project um, is really what's getting kicked off um, through this series of workshops. So a few things, um, the first and Ashley Street project, as you probably have heard and as Ian spoke to, um, this is really primarily about restoring uh, these streets back to two-way travel. Um, this map that's in the background was from the downtown street um, design manual and it was a framework plan that kind of laid out the map for how streets should be designed for downtown, what kinds of uses should be emphasized, and also very important is what's the context next to these streets? Are they going through residential areas? Are they going through commercial areas? And how do we make sure that we're designing the streets um, that respond and are sensitive to those different contexts? Um, so in addition to restoring two-way, first and Ashley, kind of as a pair was looked at as an opportunity to be a bicycle <coughs> emphasis corridor as well, which um, in the language of the design manual meant it should do something more than provide a, just a conventional bike lane. So it should do something that provides a way to again kind of attract that 50% of the population in that interested but concerned category. Um, so some of the specifics, we'll be looking to uh, restore the streets to two-way, adding protected lanes. Um, there's overlap between that project and the tree line trail um, and how that feeds in from the north end. So we'll be looking at how we can find 
uh, good synergies and opportunities to advance that project through this effort. And then really creating better connections to the neighborhood, whether that's the business districts or the residential areas. That's trying to knit these streets back into the fabric of the city and of the community and not have them be something that feels just like a corridor that you can, you can drive through quickly. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the overview of that. And then on the William Street um, bikeway project, so this is going um, from 3rd Street down all the way to State Street where it dead ends into uh, the central campus. And so this street, again, was identified as an opportunity for a bicycle emphasis corridor to have that higher level um, bicycle facility on it. So we'll be looking at the feasibility of that from a traffic standpoint and from a street design standpoint. Um, and one of the things to think about on this, so this is kind of a map of uh, the center part of the downtown. So this is uh, First Street, Ashley, William Street coming through. The orange line is the proposed route for the tree line. And so as we start to look at this and think about how we can get better access to downtown, um, one, of the, one of the questions that one of my colleagues likes to ask is, you know, where would you let your unaccompanied 10-year-old ride their bike? And right now, it's probably not downtown. But maybe in the future, if these are protected facilities and the tree line is built, now we have the bones of a system that's a lot more comfortable and a lot safer for a lot of people to be able to get downtown, whether that's going to restaurants, going to shops, getting to work, going to their jobs. Um, so this is something that we're looking to build. And then I'm thinking about how long term that might start to become kind of a loop of connection through town. So we're really looking at the feasibility of this protected facility on William Street and kind of how that, um, how that impacts and would be designed. Um, for the most part, um, both of these projects, just um, so you understand the overall scope a little bit, um, not looking to shift the curb lines around a lot. So it's generally doing improvements within the roadway or outside of the roadway, but they're not a full reconstruction of the whole street. Um, so we'll be looking to see what we can do within that kind of cross section or profile of the roadway. Um, and that applies to First and Ashley, that project <coughs> as well. Mm -hmm. um, there will be portions of First and Ashley where we are going to do streetscape improvements. So we've heard a lot of um, feedback from the public around lighting and how we can start to improve lighting along those roads, for example. So looking at that streetscape and kind of sidewalk space um, and portions of those projects will be important. I think this is almost the end here. So just in terms of overall timeline um, for the First and Ashley projects, We'll be in the design and feasibility phase um, through this fall, kind of going into October. We'll be switching um, from that into more of an engineering phase throughout next year, and then construction is targeted for spring of 2020 for these projects. Okay, uh, so a couple, few slides on Huron Street. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, Huron Street's a little further along in the design phase, so there's some ideas that are being advanced. Um, as, as part of this project, and we'll have, we have some more information on boards beyond what's being shown in here that um, you can check out after, um, after the presentation portion. Um, this street was identified as a vehicle emphasis street in the downtown plan, um, but, and this is a really important but, it still recognizes that you know, all streets need to be comfortable and safe um, for, um, for pedestrians in particular. Um, uh, especially along Huron Street where there's not a plan for a dedicated bicycle facility. And so, you know, how do we make sure that um, Huron Street is comfortable for people, that you're comfortable crossing it or walking along it? There are a lot of important uses on there. There's the City Hall, County Courthouse. There's a surprisingly, surprising amount of activity on that street despite how um, unsafe and uncomfortable it can feel at times. So there are portions that have been improved. Um, but a lot of the street feels very open and kind of inhospitable to walk along. You don't have a lot of protection. Cars are ripping along right next to you um, along the roadway. So how can we start to design that streetscape environment to feel a lot more safe and comfortable for people while still accommodating um, the traffic through that corridor? So some of the things we've heard, and these shouldn't be too surprising, um, you know, one point is that over the course of the day, the street really changes character during morning or evening rush hour, there's a lot of cars, but then in a lot of the day, it's pretty open and there's not a lot of cars and that actually encourages people to drive more quickly. Um, we've heard that you know, we do need to continue to accommodate that commuter traffic. The road feels a little fast for a downtown street. You know, we, don't, we feel vulnerable or exposed as a pedestrian. Some of the crossings 
or unsafe, particularly at um, some of the intersections where there's left turns, for instance. Um, sidewalks, unpleasant, and it's really this kind of seen as this dividing line between the different parts of downtown, um, particularly as people try to move, say, between you know, Main Street and Carytown, those parts of town. Um, it's kind of a barrier that you don't necessarily want to cross. So some of the things we're trying to do in this project, seeking transformational change, um, celebrate the role that Huron does have. It is a gateway into town for many people. So we want to res, um, reflect that idea, provide a sense of protection, increase safety, develop an adaptable design. You know, one of the things we know is with, say, um, the, the potential for autonomous vehicles and then also an increase in things like Uber and Lyft, we're seeing a lot more demand for kind of curbside space for pickup and drop off of people and goods. So you know, how do we think about accommodating that in the future and having it be more of a green and sustainable feeling street. Again, it's kind of a signature civic corridor for the town, but it really doesn't feel, um, feel that way as it looks today. So one of, the th one of the bigger changes that we're looking to do um, is um, just kind of recognizing that you know, today here's Huron, and you don't have the kind of protection along Huron that you may feel when there's on-street parking. Um, so one of the changes that we're looking to do is to do non-rush hour parking on Huron Street. And so the details of this are all still being worked out, but for example, between maybe 10 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon during the mid part of the day, there could be on-street parking. In the two hours of the morning and two hours in the evening rush hour, it would be open as a five-lane road for traffic. And then at some point in the evening, it would go back to parking. And so in the evening, you could have people parking on here on street, creating that, helping to create that buffer, along with other design treatments in the streetscape for people, as well as, of course, providing you know, more parking in close proximity to things like city hall and restaurants and shops and things. Some of the other um, kind of functional um, operational changes that we're looking to do, I'm looking to add some no turn on reds um, throughout different parts of the corridor. Um, when you allow turns on red, that tends to, cars tend to creep up into the intersections. They block crosswalks. Um, they create hazards for that. Um, adding um, protected, the, the parlance or the language is a protected left turn signal phase. So instead of having a signal, say, that left turn on the 5th Ave off of Huron, where you know, you're sitting there as a driver and you're kind of keeping an eye on traffic to find that gap that you can dive through in, in the oncoming traffic, we're not always looking out for pedestrians, so starting to add that dedicated signal, that dedicated left turn lane to accommodate that traffic, um, improving a lot of the signal timing for pedestrians, giving them more time to get across the road. And then something we're looking at a lot and working with um, MDOT and others is the Hawk signal at Chapin and Third, um, looking to improve, um, improve that and hopefully upgrade that to a full, um, full signal, traffic signal at that location so that it's a lot easier to to cross through there. There's a lot of uh, rather harrowing video footage that we have of um, everything from drivers hopping out of their cars to go and push the button so that they can turn um, onto Huron off the cross street to people just blowing through the intersection while there's groups of kids going back and forth from the YMCA, for instance, trying to get across the road there. It's not a, not a very great situation. Um, so in terms of overall schedule, um, kind of for Huron and where that's going, um, we'll be in the design and engineering phase of that through this fall, um, and that this would be going out for construction next spring, so about a year from now, um, construction scheduled to begin on that project. So again, um, these slides are focused more on the big picture changes. We have a lot of ideas for the streetscape design and how that's being built and what that could look like. Um, so we have that on some of the boards um, out in the lobby area that you can check out. Um, so that's, that's it for the main part of this. Um, I just want to point out the rest of the schedule for this week. Um, as Susan mentioned, our design team is going to be here all week. Um, today um, and then um, tomorrow in the afternoon here in the DDA office. And then on uh, Wednesday in the morning, there's an open design studio. And on Wednesday, we'll be at the, in the multi-purpose room of the library. And then again, on Thursday night, there's another public presentation that will cover some of this material, plus a lot of the design and the thinking, and kind of a synopsis of all the input that we've generated over the course of this week. So that'll be um, Thursday evening at the library as well. So. Um, 
with that, I just want to thank everybody again for coming out. Um, I do want to give ample time um, to get feedback at the boards. So I'd like to spend, though, about the next 15 minutes or so just answering questions or hearing some of your general feedback. Um, that would be that would be great.